after two eminent speakers who covered the topic in both width and depth, it makes my job much easier. You already got what you came here for. So I'll just talk about a few things that are personal to me. I want to explore this idea or this question. Can we live a life of higher significance and quality by elevating our thought process to a higher level? This needs a little bit of explanation, but I want to, in my limited time of the next 25 minutes, I would like to talk about, I would ex like to talk about a few experiences, a personal experience of mine that led me to the possibility, that led me to the conclusion that it is possible for us all to live a life of higher significance just by elevating our thinking. And that is a possibility by certain simple measures. Let me start with a simple example of what happened to me when I went to IIT Kharagpur to study. I was about barely 17. With them, for the first time, I left home and uh, in, left my small hometown, Pimavaram in Andhra Pradesh. And I went to this wonderful place called IIT Kharagpur, which was quite well known by the time. And uh, there were students from many other religions and regions countries and cultures and we, some of us became very good close friends in the sense that we used to talk about many things. We were exchanging for the first time, we were talking incessantly all the time about or what we knew and we were capturing the similar, similar experiences from other students as it happens when you are in the teens. And uh, we would talk about many subjects like Naxalism, politics, movies, Bollywood, Hollywood, music, virtually every subject under the sun, uh, especially late in the night. After several cups of tea, we used to do this. And uh, some of the things that look very interesting also turned sometimes very difficult because one day, one of my classmates who was a Sri Lankan Buddhist, he said so one of the best things that happened with, that he remembers from his Sri Lankan life in his childhood was holy monks would come in the morning at a prefix time and prefix date, three to four times in a week, to his house. And his mother would be waiting for them to come, he would ask him, this young little boy, to give the alms to the holy men and seek their blessings. He said they, they had such wonderful smile and countenance and way of blessing. And and it was one of the best images that he has of his childhood. There was another student, Sadaji, in my class, who said, oh, this is disgusting. Somebody begs, and you encourage people to beg. In my religion, nobody is allowed to beg. You don't see a Sadaji who begs. And this was very offensive to the Sri Lankan boy, who said it was very beautiful for him. And we, who are neither Sadhajis nor Buddhists, could see the beauty in both of them. There is a reason for begging and there is a reason for not begging. So the Buddhists said, look, they beg not because they are out of food, but they want, society wants them to specialize, or spare all their time for meditation and counseling and being just wonderful human beings. We don't want them to lose their time, but still this Sadhaji was not convinced. And I, we could see his point too. A man should learn to stand on his own feet, not be dependent on anybody else like a parasite and for what, whether religious or any other purpose. Both points of view were valid. And we could see, and they could not see, both of them, the opposition that was coming from each other. A little later we saw similar problems with, between Christian friends of mine and Muslim <coughs> friends, because Muslim friend once said, to a Christian friend who had a Christ symbol with a cross, he said, well, this is all not really, you know, this is not really progressive because the God cannot be symbolized into small human being level. It's so abstract, so powerful. And to think of him as somebody who lives and bleeds, if you hit him, as is very 
is not very progress here at all because my religion came a little later. It's much more evolved was the line of thinking and of course to which many of us, many of the friends made and said, yeah, we want to convert to Islam because we can get married four times and so on. Okay. So, but at one time, somebody asked a question after several months of this kind of various discussion that were happening. Hey, let's not look at the differences in the religion, let's look at what's common between the religions. Just in a matter of two minutes, it became clear that all religions talk about love, compassion, kindness to other people, respect for other human beings. And all that is common is between the religions is what every religion is about. So why are we looking at some small practices, let's go beyond this, and afterwards none of us started this. Just in those two, three minutes, the clarity that came, and it's important to get the clarity because clarity gives energy to go forward with energy, with tremendous enthusiasm to understand things at a higher level. Just elevating yourself, not look at the differences, but look at the commonality between the religions. That was a tremendous lesson that I picked up from those conversations. Of course, in those many conversations, there was one question that was always there, that Every day it was, we were faced with a conversation, that question. And there was one question which should, not have, which should have been there and it was never there, like all students understand this. The one question that we always wanted to see was, was on top of the mind was, what's for lunch? <laughs> we were so hungry, but we were also hungry for things beyond food. 1969, when I went to IIT Kharagpur, there was a time when man landed in the moon and it was exciting for any young man, for anybody in this world, to see for the first time somebody was able to land on a moon, which is millions of kilometers away, and return and bring that experience to the, to the imagination of young children. It was extraordinary. And so we used to talk a lot about technology and what we can do and the possibilities of abundance that can be created by scientific pursuits. Uh, it was a really exciting times to be in. The one question that we never asked, we never discussed was how we were doing it in our own studies. That was never part of any of the discussions. But I'm glad because studies is anyway way taken for granted. We all had to do reasonably well to get, go and get a job. But the excitement of those days was wonderful. But what I took away from that was this ability to stand slightly above our narrow differences and look at the commonalities. And when we find the answers to questions that actually energize us, that give us more hope for going forward with energy. Second such thing happened uh, when I was in the Institute of Science, Bangalore, and I won't go into details. It just at the end of a large, long discussion late into the night, we came to the conclusion we don't understand all these religions and practices and things like this, but we understand above all that every man wants to be happy. Everyone, not just man, every man and woman, everyone wants to be happy. But there is a nice corollary to it. None of us can be happy if people around us are miserable. None of us can be healthy if people around us are unhealthy. None of us can be wealthy if people around us all are poor. If they are not poor, it's only a matter of time. There will be violence, there will be unhappiness there will be unhealthiness. So it is important that if we want to be help, happy, that we make sure that not only we strive for our happiness, but we strive for those of us in our family, in our community, in our organizations where we work, in the country where we live, wherever possible, we need to bring in the same level of happiness, work for their happiness too, not just our own. Because as a lone person, if you are trying to be happy, it doesn't work. What is beautiful about this is synthesis is that what looks like a selfishness, I want to be happy, actually requires that you be, un be altruistic and make sure that everybody else around you happy, be happy. Because in the absence of that, you cannot be happy at all. You cannot be healthy if everybody around you is unhealthy, either physically or mentally. So this ability to bring polarities together, the opposites together, is the example, is, is what is higher life thinking about. The 
looking at life from a higher pedestal essentially means that you were able to synthesize or take a thesis and antithesis like selfism, selfishness and altruism and create a synthesis of a higher value. Combine both of them and find a path that requires both selfishness and unselfishness. The third one example is, uh, is an extraordinary example that I saw. Uh, as you, some of you know that I did this 108 experiment and I was invited to Panchagani to give a talk by Rajmohan Gandhiji. Uh, and I was giving a talk and one, one, I, I went there a couple of times. One day I met a couple, not a couple, uh, not two individuals. Uh, one is a lady by name Jin Fayur. She's from South Africa, a white American, a white South African woman. She's 60 plus. She and was she was a school teacher or something, just about retired when I met her. She came, and then there's a black man, uh, Leila Patla was his name. He was about 35 at that time, and he was a South African black freedom fighter and a very energetic young man. And the relationship between them is that. This black man shot and killed the white woman's daughter, 19-year-old daughter. When they talked about it, they went onto the stage and talked about it and gave their life story. It was stunning. It had made such an impact on all of us to see them talking to each to this talk. They gave their life story like this. This young woman, for a 19-year-old girl lively girl, apparently for all accounts, full of life, uh, enjoyed dancing, was good at many things. And But so there was some white people have done something to some black people somewhere and they decided to kill one white person and she happened to be there. They picked her, she was an easy target. She was go, going home late in the evening and they shot her. And the white woman, this lady Jin, she's it took a long time for her, to, several months, to get out of the grief and anger and frustration. But at that time, she kept her cool. Many of her daughter's friends, she told me, came and told her, just give us permission and we'll kill him. But she said, no, if I do that, then they will be killing some of you. Some other black men some, from some other place, maybe his relatives, maybe his friends, will come and kill you people. That's not what you want. So I went over this for several months and came back and decided one day she announced to all the people in the thing and through newspapers that she wants to go and meet this black man who killed her daughter. There's tremendous opposition from the whites and also from the blacks because this can polarize and, and tear emotions apart. Already the country was in bad shape and this was this could just set it up in flames. She said, no, I want to meet him. I want to talk to him in public, in openness. She went there, surrounded. She, many white people went with her, some of them with arms. The black people came. Also, in the, actually, it was their village. She went there. Black people were standing, some, some of them with sticks and knives and so on, and guns. She, she did not say, I forgive you. She did not say, I am extremely upset, but I still forgive you. She said, in great immortal words, and this is, by the way, this is uh, documented in a, in a documentary by BBC called Beyond Forgiveness. And this lady said, I, I, at that point I said, I want you black people to forgive me and my, all the white people that have come to this country and ruined you. For the first time, I've understood that many of you have daughter, lost your daughters, your aunts, your mothers, your sisters. What it is like, I understand now. We came to this country. We raped the land. We imposed ourselves the arms that we have. When I read it in history, it was just a piece of statistic for me. So many people were killed, so many houses of white people were burnt, and so on. But when I, when my own daughter was killed, 
it taught me to empathize with all of you. To understand what you must have felt when you lost your women or men, boys or daughters. So I first think it is white people's mistake to have come to your country and do this. I came here to apologize on behalf of all the white people. In the moments after that speech, everybody was hugging each other. You should see the documentary to get look at what it means. I had tears in my eyes when I saw this. And this directly, and these two people now go around from country to country talking about peace and meaningness of forgiving, meaningness, meaning of elevating ourselves beyond the differences and seeing the bigger picture. Uh, Lala Patla was also very interested. He's very energetic, but now he's more seasoned politician. He's still there in the country as a uh, as a extraordinary example of what brotherhood can, can do. What he does, he goes out of the way to talk about white people and doing, keeping an inclusive society. So, essentially, the concept of elevating ourselves to a perspective where we can see the problems and the solutions much easier than remaining in the same plane is what it is about to have higher level of thinking. Uh, the analogy that I give to some of my mentees is that if you are an ant, if you look at an ant and it's going around to find, a, let's say, a spot of honey somewhere and there are lots of obstacles, if you are on the same level as the ant, you can only see what the ant can see and it can't see far beyond. It can't see beyond the obstacle. Only when you elevate yourself to a higher level, you can tell, see what's the easiest one. The ant has to go through all possibilities, go by instinct, by smell and so on and figure it out. But you, slightly higher level, can see, not because you are smarter, but your perspective, your viewpoint, the standpoint is higher. You are able to see beyond the different obstacles that has in, come out of the path. It's the same thing that happens to all of us. With this third example, I was really touched by what a little bit of elevation of our thinking to be tolerant, to understand the other point of view has taught me. This is just a remarkable incident. Then Einstein once said, I remember I have been a scientist and I love science, uh, like he said about the independent variables. Einstein said, you cannot solve the problems of the world today by a level of thinking that has created the problems in the first place. You, in order to solve the problems of today in the world, you have to elevate yourself to a higher level and it's then that you will be able to figure out what not. When there is a conflict, for instance, you don't ask who is right. If A and B are fighting, A thinks A is right, B thinks B is right. Can we ask, instead of who is right, can we ask a question, what is right? Is this right that people kill each other for their differences? Or should we elevate ourselves to a level where we see the differences as small obstacles, not a big deal? Just as we did for the religions when I was a student at the airport. So that brings me to one important final thing that I was very pleased to learn. It's a viewpoint that I would love to share with all of you. Uh, Professor Robert Keegan of Howard University is a professor for the last 40, year, 40 years in Howard University, an elderly state person with tremendous knowledge. He had done lots of experiments and psychology and sociology and so on. His subject is about consciousness. And this particular thing is of great uh, importance to many of us. He said, if you look, step back and look at human beings over a large sweep of time, let's say a couple of hundred, thousands of years, maybe 500,000 years, if you take a long look, something strange is happening to the human species. For one thing, but there has not been much change for a long time, but in the last uh, less than 1,000 years, the explosion of the numbers, people have become large. The numbers of people that are alive today is very large compared to people that were alive at any point of time. 150 years ago, we were less than about a billion people. Now we are about 7 plus billion. So the numbers have exploded enormously. But there's another interesting that's happening. 
<coughs> people are living much longer. Like someone said, it's, we used to be, uh, uh, the span of life was in uh, develop, developing countries, it used to be about under 30 at the time of our independence in many countries, including India. But now it is much higher, 60, 70, 80, and 90. And very soon it's likely that there will be a lot of centenarians. It will not be a rare phenomenon. Quite a few is likely with the advances in science and technology and medicine and sensors and so on, which is likely to happen. And many countries are beginning to worry about it because the cost of it is very high, etc. But Robert Keegan sees it in a very different light. He says, this is the best asset that we have. And he gives a huge amount of reasoning. I'll just give a little framework of it. The consciousness development in human beings is generally classified into four. Infant level, and one doesn't have any much of a consciousness on this step. Goes cries, the baby cries when he reads well, food, or when he is happy, and so on. Just impulse to them. Second is a childhood state. Uh, they want toys, you want this, you want that, you want to experiment something, you want to jump up, you want to climb, and so on. That's the child stage. Uh, each of it is great characterized in great detail about what, what drives them, what their awareness levels, and so on. Third stage is the adolescent stage, where consciousness is about conforming to the society, finding out, oh, that's what the teacher says, this is what my parents say, this is what uh, my neighbors say, my friends say, or this is what Guru Nanak says, or this is what Buddha says, and so on. So they formulate some conformistic models. Okay, this is how I should do. If I pray to God like my mother tells me that I'll get, I'll get to do well in school, or I'll do this. If I speak truth, something will happen, and so on. The next stage as an adult is self-authoring. You realize that you can't please everybody. So you accept that this is what you are, and this is what you're going to be. Slowly, that script gets written. It's called self-authorship stage. You identify with yourself. You say, I'm like this. I am like this. I will not take this nonsense from anybody. Or I will do this. Or I will be very smart. I will be diplomatic. And so on. So, so many types of rules you set for yourself that is about conscious adult. For a long time, so psychologists and psychiatrists and so on, human beings have been classified into only these four categories. But Keegan says there's a fifth category, and that's very important for this understanding. And that is a trans self transformation stage, for the fifth stage. When it talks about what's important here is that you realize that you may be a Muslim. But you also see the point of view of others. You may be Hindu, you see the point of view of others. You may be a rich man, but you also see the poor man's point of view. Which is most, he can say, is most, most people who can't get to that stage. In fact, many people may not get to that stage ever. But distinctively, this stage develops a little later in life. 40, less than 40, most people don't get it. After 40, some people get it. And this is the transformative stage. And he says, concludes very beautifully about some of the things that can come out of this. The vast majority of the people, you see, un after the reproductive and fertility part of life, this is the only species that lives as long as human beings do. If you live till 90 or 100, you are, you know, people used to live till 30 or 40 earlier. So the, what's, that's become a midlife. So you have many years of Physical disintegration, human life in, in the physical sense, it goes up and then comes down. But the consciousness level actually goes up until you start forgetting all together. Until that stick comes, and it comes very late to most people. You may forget small names and this and that, but you may not forget the ability to take a thesis, antithesis, and to come up with a synthesis of something better comes much more easily. You're less identified with some small thing like, oh, I have a car, I have a, this, or I have a beautiful uh, vacation home someplace, or I have a wonderful family, and so on. Beyond, you are somebody beyond all these things. That consciousness is something that we actually cultivate, and is extremely optimistic that the large number of people that are living beyond this 
are a great source of support for an ecosystem that's breaking apart. They, they will provide a number of alternative ways of looking because the strife, the survival mode, the, the tribal thinking of anybody who is not with me is an enemy of mine, that is the source of the tensions of the world. But if it can be contracted, as he beautifully says, a 30-year-old parent knows how to guide, look over, look after, and watch over a 10-year-old child. In the same way, a 60 or 70 year old should be able to look after a 40 year old misguided young man, just take care of him, guide him a little bit. And this is a fantastic possibility. So, there are eminent NW people in this stage, and there are quite a few on the audience. I felt so good when I learned about it, and it's being talked about in a lot of places in the management circles. It's called vertical development. They make a distinction today in the management circles between horizontal development and vertical development. Horizontal development is learning more skills, like I'm going to learn more about accounting, or dancing, or painting, or whatever. These are the things that you acquire from outside. Skills, knowledge, and experiences. Those you acquire. But vertical development is not about external acquire. It's about internally, how, how do we elevate ourselves to a higher level of maturity, higher level of finesse, higher level of sophistication, higher level of wisdom. These are possible when you look at yourself and look at your own prejudices, look at your own possibilities of doing brilliant things when the younger generations are not are getting torn apart with their personal desires to do well, to be recognized and establish themselves and so on. But there are bigger things on which they cannot pay attention because they are in a different mode. Just as a 10-year-old is all he is concerned with the toy that he gets or he doesn't get. Elderly people know that, we understand, we give them some toys, but we don't let them assume that the world is only about toys. We give them responsibility. Slowly we bring them to even to maintain that toy or break that toy apart, no, put it back. That itself is a way of guiding the child. Can we do this? as older people, as we generate this fifth dimension of consciousness, which can be elevated by certain techniques like meditation, being calm, learning meaning of equanimity under any circumstances, these are all not some difficult things. If a 17-year-old in, in a college can come up with some simple ways of reconciling the differences between two religions, certainly many of us can do and thrive and show a better way of processing the world's technology, world's improvements and the perils that have come. We know there are major dangers in the world today and the young older generations now with this elevated standpoint or a viewpoint of your consciousness where you bring it to that level. That is a way of bringing in harmony into the world in a way the world hasn't seen before. Thank you very much.